It's 2018, and uh, we had left Willow, and I had kind of stepped out, um, and I found myself at a Starbucks, and I had my son at the time. He's 14 now. It's about four years ago. It's uh, nine and a half, I think, at the time, almost 10, and we are um, walking out of Starbucks, and someone I knew from Willow was, saw us walking out. They were coming in, and all of a sudden, tears just like erupted, and then all of a sudden, she got triggered seeing me and began to say, um, you're a coward. You abandoned us. She didn't know the whole story. She didn't know everything I knew, whatever. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm just sitting there taking this. And my son is watching this. And finally, like after a few minutes, uh, she gets done, storms off, goes into Starbucks. And I walk to her car. And I'm, I'm like trying to like open my, the door for my son, sit in the back seat. And my son just looks at me and he goes, Dad... And he's an old soul. He came out with like a cardigan. And uh, like he's, it's like a, this, this, he is, he is a, a unique bird in so many ways. And I just think the world of him, obviously, is my son. I'm biased. But <clears throat> I'll never forget he, he just looks at me and goes, Dad, you always taught me that if you did the right thing, you'll get rewarded. So you either didn't do the right thing or you don't always get rewarded for doing the right thing. And you lied to me. And I was like, oh, well, this just, I thought that conversation was the worst. <laughs> um, and it, it was amazing in this moment because the Spirit of God just gave me this picture. And our first son's Emerson. Our second is a little girl named Mercy, um, which Emerson actually named. And but when my wife was pregnant with Mercy, um, it was just a terrible pregnancy and multiple, uh, just, just, just multiple complications. And I'll never forget just God just depositing a word in that moment just to say, hey, remember when mom was pregnant with Mercy? How sick she was? And it was nine, 10 months and it was brutal. But that day in May, when we held mercy for the very first time, mom said it was all worth it. And I'm like, I have no idea of when we're gonna have that moment of holding mercy in this story, but I promise you we will. I promise you we will. And he's like, okay. And then he's in the car. But I'm like, oh my goodness. And, and, and so I went to bed that night and I think it was that night, it might have been the next night, but I woke up in the middle of the night and um, I had this strong sense from God and it was literally like, go to the desert and wait for instructions. So I kind of got up and it just, I don't know if you've had one of those moments where you just, like it felt so rare, so strong, just so like impressed upon my heart. So I grabbed my journal, I went in the living room, I started to write and I wrote these words, uh, you can't achieve your way out of this, you can only grieve your way through it. And I, I, I felt I couldn't make these people happy. I felt like I had lost my dream job. I felt all of this, this stuff and everything inside me was trying to revert back to what I knew, which was go be a part of something that's up and to the right. Go achieve, go climb, go strive, go make something. I had muscle memory for that, but in my faith tradition, I never heard a sermon on the book of Lamentations. I, ne I never understood how to grieve, which is why I think so much pain and struggle has happened during COVID, not just because of the global pandemic, not just because of death, not just because... But this wasn't a physical pandemic. Yes, it was. But it wasn't fully that. It was a mental health revealer. That for many of us, we, we had coping mechanisms and we didn't know how to grieve. We didn't know how to sit with our sadness. And I didn't know how to. So I was thinking 
that the desert was spiritual, that it was metaphorical, that God wasn't going to take me to some great spot. He was going to take me to Shreveport or Biloxi or I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like some, like some place that was so outside my like uh, just thought, if you're from Biloxi or Shreveport, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that as a negative. It's just somewhere I had no idea. And then the next morning, Sarah, my wife, wakes up. And I'm telling her what I just sensed and experienced. And she just tears up and she just says, I've been sensing the same thing. I just want to go home. And she's from Arizona. So we moved to Arizona. We moved to the desert. I start reading everything I can because if you, if you read anything by Eugene Peterson, um, he talks about how the topography is profound theology. How, how that there is in the place that God has put you has something to shape and teach you. And so I was like, well, if we're going to the desert, I'm going to read everything I can on these desert mothers and fathers. And it was unbelievable. It was 2019, 2020. I think they had 65 days over 110, which is a great evangelism strategy. You just walk up to a random person and be like, this could be your eternity. <laughs> but there's another way. There's another way. But uh, I, I, we, we ended up, um, during COVID, um, going in with my in-laws and we bought this little cabin up in Sholo, Arizona. It's such a fun word to say, Sholo. And Sholo was uh, a city that was named when two very wealthy guys went to a bar and started to play a game of poker. And I think they were both a little bit belligerent um, because they made a bet that didn't make any sense. The bet was whoever wins this hand gets the land of the other and gets the naming rights to create a city. So they're like, well, what do you want to play? They don't play Hold'em. They just play the game Show Low. So whatever's the low card. So this guy gets the deuce of clubs and he goes, here it is. And I named the city Show Low. And so if you go in downtown Show Low, it's all deuce of clubs highway. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. But it's this cute little, little, town and what's great about it is it's 30 degrees cooler than Glendale, <laughs> than Phoenix, than the desert. And so we, we went up there and we just started to rebuild this cabin. And what was amazing about this cabin is there was all this drop down ceiling, teal carpet, like old, old like kitchen. And I thought it was fine. I was like, great, we can just go up here and, and not have to sweat every day. We just go up here. This would be super helpful. And my wife just was like, it has good bones, but everything inside of it has to go. And I was like, no more Chip and Joe for you. And, uh, but so she's like, hey, let's start demoing it. And we start demoing this whole thing. And what was amazing is when we, we started to remove the drop down ceiling, all of this natural light just started to appear that had all been blocked. And it was this crazy experience. I, I, I'll still never forget it. Like I'm pulling up tile, I'm ripping out this, this drop down ceiling, taking out this kitchen. And I, I, I felt like it was this profound spiritual experience. And I felt like God was saying, this is what I've been trying to do in you. Open you up for more of my light to come in. And, and I, it brought me back to uh, one of Dallas Willard's books, uh, Renovation of the Heart. And I realized like how important if we're going to be people who have our character lead the way, if we're going to be the kind of people who watch our life and watch our doctrine, we actually have to be the kind of people who are consistently and constantly renovating our heart. Because we have profound experiences, painful experiences, exhilarating experiences, exciting experiences, and they're all resting in our heart. And what I've come to realize, too, is that there's so many of us, so many of us who, if I were to ask you about your vision, you would tell me your church's vision. You know it. You know the goals that you're going after. But if I was asked, like, no, no, what's like your spiritual vision? Like, what, what's God doing in you right now? Many of us in leadership don't have that. We, we know what we're doing for Christ and we know what we're doing for the institution. We know what we're doing for the church. We know what we're doing for our community. But like, what, what are we allowing and making space for God to do in us? And so what I want to do is I want to walk you through this. And 
I would love, <clears throat> this is just a dream, I would love that this would be kind of a moment as we go into to noontime, but that maybe God might from now, just think from now till Independence Day, from now till July 4th, almost what might a vision be for you? And I'm going to make it uber practical because uh, for me, again, the thing that moved me so much about Tiger was that like he looked at his swing and he found something to grow on, to work on. And I, I, I think that if we're going to be the kind of people that when they look at us, they see Christ at work. If you, if you read Henry Nouwen's Reaching Out, it tells a story about an, a former student who came to him. He had been in the area for business, showed up at Yale and sat in, in the back of one of the classes that he remembered Dr. Nowen teaching. He walked up to Dr. Nowen and said, Dr. Nowen, I, I, I used to be a student of yours. I'm in town for business. I'm free for lunch. You got any margin today? And Dr. Nowen said, yeah, actually someone can canceled. I'm free. So they grabbed lunch. They sit by this beautiful area at Yale. And all of a sudden, at, at, at the end of it, after two hours of just radical hospitality, sharing one's lives, breaking themselves open, pouring themselves out. The former student looks at Dr. Nowen and says, Dr. Nowen, when I'm with you, I feel as if I'm in the presence of Christ. And Nowen was kind of taken back by that. But he quickly responds, my son, it's the Christ in you that recognizes the Christ in me. And, and, and I think that this is what I want for us, that when people look at you, they can see Christ at work. They can see Christ with. They can see Christ doing a new thing. They can see the healing, the renewal, the restoration, the hope. They can see Christ at work. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll start there. We'll jump to John chapter 10. But Hebrews 6, 19, a, f a verse that many of us know, says this. We have this hope. And I told you about hope. We desire something good. Anything is possible because the tomb is empty. Resurrection brings certainty and confidence and we can expect any, something to be good. Not often in our timing, but some good is going to come. But we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We have this hope. And he's talking about Christ. We have this hope, this anchor for our soul. It's firm, it's secure, it's steadfast. I think what's incredible is, is if, I love that kind of the, the visual of an anchor. I spent many, many years uh, in Michigan. I remember being out in Lake Michigan on, a, on, on the water, and we were, it was a beautiful day in July, and a buddy had a, a nice boat, and he's like, hey, throw the anchor out. And so I was like, oh, where is it? And he's like, it's in the front of the boat. I know nothing about boats. And so I'm like, okay. And so like, I, I see the anchor, and so I just throw it out. It's not connected to the boat. <laughs> So all of a sudden, I was like, well, what's the point of that? And he's like, it wasn't connected? I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so we dive down, and we don't get it, you know. And, and it, I started to, like, as a preacher, I started thinking, I'm like, how many anchors are at the bottom of Lake Michigan or Lake Erie or Lake Superior or Lake Ontario or Lake Huron or, like, the Pacific or the Atlantic or the Gulf? And, and you start to think, this one anchor is connected to a boat that's worth 100,000, 200,000, 400,000, if you're a Russian Ogolark or whatever you say that word is, seven billion dollars, you know what I mean? These, these, these yachts are insane, all connected to this one anchor. And it's fascinating, it's like everywhere we go, we have this hope, we have this anchor, like in Christ, it's sure, it's secure. But if you're like me, are there ever any moments you're in a conversation with someone and for some apparent reason, you just drop that anchor and you literally just like, say what you think. Allow passive aggressiveness, or last negativity or some toxic gossip or some sense. And all of a sudden it's like, you just drop that anchor for a moment. And, and what's amazing is, is you think about how much money is connected to this anchor or how much potential is connected to this spiritual anchor. And I've been thinking a lot about this because Jesus, Jesus wanted us to live with a vision, like a real vision, a vision for how we were going to anchor and ground our life. And Dallas, Dallas Willard would talk about this. When I was at Hope International, I uh, read Divine Conspiracy for the very first time. 
It took me, I think, seven times to get past chapter three, but I did finish it. And I remember um, I, I was just that random kid who, when I read a book, I would call the author and just say thank you. And so I, um, I called USC because Dallas was a professor of philosophy at USC. And I just, I just wanted to call and, and just say on a, maybe his office phone, a voicemail, and just say thank you. And the, the woman in the philosophy department said, oh, you know Dallas? I was like, yeah. Oh, well, Dallas, Dallas just announced that he's on sabbatical for the year. Um, but I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Here's his home number. I was like, this is the greatest day of my life. So I called, and it went straight to, voice, or to answer machine. And so I left a message. Hi, Dallas. My name is Steve Carter. Really just want to say thank you. Just finished Dallas, uh, Divine Conspiracy. Just was really helpful. Gave me great language for the kingdom of God. Hey, if you ever want to talk, um, here's my number. He doesn't call back. So my buddies were like, did Dallas ever call back? I'm like, no. He's like, maybe they didn't get your message. I'm like, maybe, maybe he didn't. So I call the next day. I leave another message. Well, it became kind of this joke with my friends Tommy and Kevin. They're like, you should probably call him again. And I'm like, yeah, I probably should. He would want to know. I just want to buy. And so it became this probably for three and a half months. I called almost every single day to the point where one day at, after a, a homiletics class, I went back and I'm like, oh, and I walked into my apartment and Tommy's like, you called Dallas today? Nope. And so I called and all of a sudden, as the answering machine went beep, hi Dallas, this is Steve Carter. <laughs> and all of a sudden I heard somebody pick up and I'm like, this is going to be amazing. I finally worked. Nobody can say I'm not persistent. The Bible says to persevere. I'm persevering. I got endurance. And it was sweet Jane Willard, his wife, who's like, hi, Steve. Dallas is really grateful for your messages. I hope you have a great day. And she hung up on me. <laughs> and, uh, and fast forward a couple of years, and uh, I'm, I'm at this conference in San Diego and our church uh, got a lunch with Dallas Willard. And so we're sitting in San Diego and all of a sudden one person, Dallas is just so kind. He's like, what is your name? And what, what do you do? And how do you see the kingdom? It was just so, just James Earl Jones-ish. It was so beautiful. And so I'm, I'm next to him, but he starts over here. I was the first guy, Mark Boss, da da da, goes like da 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 da, comes to me. And he's like, young man. And I'm like, oh, my name is Steve. And he's like, yes, Steve what? And I'm like, Steve Carter. And he's like, okay. And then he looks back at me like he remembered. <laughs> and I just nodded. And, uh, and, and so we, we started this little relationship. He was super kind. He had a restraining order on me. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but it enabled some moments with him that I was able to learn. And I don't know if you've ever experienced something where you've learned something and it made sense. Like it, ma it, made, it made cognitive sense. You just didn't have room in your life to actually apply it. So you're like, oh, I, I subscribe to that. I like that. That's beautiful. <laughs> I don't actually know how to do it or totally going to make the space to do it, um, but I like it. And, and, and I think that's how I felt a lot about Dallas's work until I experienced pain. And, and then I started to revert back to what I learned from him, and it started to all make f so much more sense. And he would always talk about how you had to have this flourishing vision. He said that Jesus, in John chapter 10, offers up two visions. He says, and you know this verse, that there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. Two visions, right, in this one verse. He's like, there's one, there's one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if I steal something, that means you have something that I want. If I'm willing to kill you, that means I just want no life. But if I'm going to destroy you in the original language, that means I want there to be no lasting legacy. This is what the thief is trying to do. I'm trying to steal your joy. I'm trying to steal your peace. I'm trying to kill that spirit of gentleness and kindness and goodness, I'm literally trying to destroy any sense of legacy that anything that can be passed down from your work. 
I'm trying to destroy the idea that you will finish well. And Jesus, then on the other hand, says, but I got a vision too. And my vision is that you would have life and have it overflowing or have it abundantly. And he's not saying it aspirationally. We've all done that, right? Casting vision, aspirationally, trying to challenge. Jesus is saying it from full. I'm offering you a life like I'm already living. And I, I think for many of us, we don't have that. What's the, what's the vision for this season in which God is wanting to open you up to renovate your heart, your mind, your body, your essence, your soul, so that you can begin to take steps to look more like Christ? For me, vision is an important thing. Vision is just one, in Dallas' language, uh, one God-inspired way to be more like Jesus. I'm not asking you to like do everything. I'm just, I'm just in this short kind of 90 days, what is one small way that you can like kind of go, man, I, this is one area that I need to grow in. And, and if you don't have one, just look at the, the fruit of the Spirit. There's nine words right there. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Good, I got them all. And like, I think you can look at one of those and go, gosh, is anywhere in your life that you're like, man, you know what? I, I don't feel like joy is something. I feel like I'm overwhelmed with anxiety or just stress. I don't have peace. I, I, I don't have a sense of gentleness when it doesn't go my way. I don't have a feeling of patience at all. I don't have goodness or kindness. Now for me, the, the word that I've been thinking so much about is self-control. Self-control. If I'm going to watch my life closely, like 1 Timothy says, I'm realizing, gosh, like self-control is so important. As so I've just been kind of like just living with this phrase for the last year, that a life, this is my vision, just sharing it out, a life anchored in Jesus is one that has nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. And for me, the self-control piece of that, because I, I, I know, I know this for a fact, nobody drifts towards holiness. Nobody woke up one day and was like, craziest thing, I preach like Billy Graham. You don't drift towards goodness and joy and peace and patience, you don't drift towards that. And I know some of you are going to be like, Steve, this sounds a lot like works. But you know what Dallas would say? Grace is opposed to earning, but never opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earn. You can't earn grace, but it does take effort to take what you have received and get it into every atom and molecule and pothole in your story to actually have that, to live a life, as John Wesley would say, as sanctifying grace. It takes effort. And we put that effort into message prep, or we put that effort into writing an email to a donor. We put that effort into so many areas, but into our own spiritual formation and transformation. I don't know if we always do that. And this is what Dallas was so big on. So if you have a vision, and I'm going to give you a moment at the end to kind of write a vision, just, just for like the next 90 days. But he said, underneath that is the word intention. Intention. So vision and intention. Now before I give you the definition of intention, let me teach you about wills. You have within you the impulsive will. And the impulsive will is just where you want to do what you want to do. You know, you, you are, have this anchor, this hope that is sure and steadfast, that's secure and firm. You're holding on to it, and then all of a sudden, you are tempted. You have this moment where you are tempted to say something, you are tempted to look at something, you're tempted to buy something, you're tempted to say yes to people, please. You're tempted to do something, and your impulsive will takes over, and you drop the anchor, and you do it, because you do what you want to do. But on the other side of that, 
When you have this anchor that's sure and secure and firm and steadfast, this hope for your soul, and you find yourself in a situation and you have a clear vision, the other will that you have isn't the impulsive will where you do what you want to do. It is the reflective will. And this is where you reflect and you ponder, if I say yes to this, will it help me live out my vision? Or if I say no to this, will it help me live out my vision? And you have the ability in real time to reflect and go, oh, this is going to help me. I, 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 was, I was fishing with my son and uh, I, was, I was struggling. I was struggling. He wasn't. He caught six fish. I hadn't caught one. And then he's like, Dad, how many have you caught? I'm like, I haven't caught any. He's on the other side of the boat. It's my father-in-law's boat. So finally, like, he, he's like, hey, Dad, I got another one. He pulls it up. This is the biggest one yet. How many have you caught? I'm like, none. He's like, I'm on number seven. That's so awesome. And I'm like, yeah, that is so awesome. I'm such a competitor. I'm a three on the Enneagram. My mantra is if I'm not winning, I'm sinning. And so like I, I start to sin in this moment. So I'm like, hey, come over here, bud. I was like, we're looking down in the water. I'm like, do you see any of the fish? He's like, no. I'm like, what have you been using for bait? He's like, ah. Uh. And he's looking. I'm like, because I've been using that bait right there. And he's like, which one? And I just pushed him in. And, um, and, and he's like, who would you do that for? And I'm like, ah, because... Pride comes before the fall, you know, and you got to learn this stuff. And I jumped in with them. We had a good time. I get out, though, and I'm like, hey, I want you to see something, though. There's something, there's something about this. Can you imagine if, if, like, you casted that bait out there? It's just starting, that little worm is starting to kind of drift under the water. And all of a sudden, this, this fish, beautiful rainbow trout, swims up to it. And right before he's about to bite it, he's got another friend. And this other friend walks up to him or swims up to him and says, hey, 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 hey don't do it. Don't do it. It's like, why? Because you're going to bite that and it's not even real. And there's a hook on the other side of it. And it's literally going to go right through your gum. And the plastic surgery, your insurance company is not going to be able to pay for it. And there's a kid on the other side of it who's nine years old, 10 years old who has no idea what he's doing. He's just, having, he's just getting super lucky today. And he's going to yank your face all over the place. And then he's going to pull you in, and you're going to be so out of breath. And then they're going to yank your face off this hook. And then you're going to be like shaking and scared and bleeding out of your mind. And then grandma from the back of the boat is going to walk up with an iPad to try and take a picture of this little boy with you in their hand. And she's not going to know how to work the iPad, and it's going to be an awkward picture. Then what they're going to do is they're going to open up a cooler, and there's going to be a bag of ice, and they're going to throw you with seven of your other friends that are just going to be there. And you're going to ice out. And then they're going to drive, and then they're going to load you up, and you're not going to see the light of day for another few hours. And then, 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 you're going to get to this house that you've never been to and you're going to smell something you've never smelt and it's charcoal and it's the grill and it's it's the Weber grill and it's going to smell great and then they're going to pull you out and there's going to be tomatoes and cilantro and some mango and all of a sudden they're going to they're going to like cut you and then they're going to be making salsa and then they're going to put you on this grill and they're going to heat you up and then they're going to slice you up and they're going to fry you. And then they're going to put you on a corn tortilla and you're going to become a Baja fish taco. <laughs> How good does that look? And this, this is the act of playing it out. And when you have a clear vision and you can literally go, is this actually going to help me become the kind of person where Christ has the most free reign in my life? then great, say yes. But if not, it's not worth it. And John Orberg, I, I, I love him, he's a mentor, dear friend, and he, he always says, Steve, you know what's so amazing is sin is fun. You know, it's, it's like you can go to alcohol and that will give you a fleeting sense of peace, but it won't make you a person of peace. 
And so sometimes when the impulsive will takes over, we're looking for a fleeting sense of peace, but the reflective will is what's going to help us become a person of peace. Does this make sense? So what's amazing, though, is Dallas would say you have the impulsive will, you do what you want to do. You have the reflective will where you reflect and ponder, will this help me become the vision? But he says underneath this is the most important one. He calls it the embodied will. The embodied will. And the embodied will is the muscle memory where you actually become this. So if you grew up as a child of an alcoholic, you watched your parents come home on a Tuesday night, pull in the driveway, and somehow when that garage door went up, they started tasting whiskey or beer or wine or bourbon. It's somehow just the sound of the garage door and they were like, I'm done for the day and now I can just lay back and pop open a few. And all of a sudden it just trips something inside them. Because what's crazy is the impulsive will has muscle memory. And it doesn't even have to be for like crazy sin. Let's just talk about how many of you, the last thing you do before you go to bed is you check your phone. Or the first thing that you do in the morning is check your phone. That's embodied will. It's literally the muscle memory where you're like, that's what I do. And the times that you choose not to do it, what's amazing is you have these phantom vibrates, right? You're like, what's going wrong? What's going wrong? It's like, it's like your whole equilibrium is like shook. Your homeostasis is like off. And so, so what's amazing though is Dallas would say that when you actually are working and have a clear vision for patience and you reflect and ponder in this moment where everything inside you wants to be impatient, but you're like, no, 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 Jesus, teach me how to be patient here. Teach me how to be steadfast. I'm not going to let go of this sure and secure and steadfast and firm anchor. I'm just going to let your sanctifying grace work in me to be patient, to exhale, even though they are not going at my pace, even though it's not going on my time, I'm choosing to trust you that that has embodied will. And that's when you literally become a person of patience. So you have a vision and the vision then is going to drive the impulsive will, the reflective will, but hopefully if you make the right decisions day in and day out, you will actually have this embodied will. And every day we have 35,000 choices. In Hebrew, we know it, Deuteronomy, I set before you life and death, or even before that, God says, I, I, I call heaven and earth as witnesses. I mean, it's just so cosmic. I, I call heaven and earth as witnesses that today I set before you life and death, blessings and destruction. Now choose life. And the word choose in Hebrew is the word bahar, and it literally means whatever you choose, you boldly proclaim is the best possible way to live. Every one of our decisions matters because if you take that back to the garden where God is shaping and forming and he puts his image inside of us and he, unlike any other religion, says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to showcase my glory and who I am and what I'm about by the way my people choose to live. So if we're all a bunch of people who are choosing impulsive will, I just do what I want to do. I want to do what I want to do. I just do what's easy. I'm going to just do whatever I can to escape. I do whatever is going to help me numb out. What are we showcasing about how great God is? But when we are actually people who are living with a vision and such intention, and when I think of intention, here's the definition, our personal decisions day by day to overcome and become more like Christ. Our decisions personal decisions day by day to overcome and become more like Christ. And this is the effort it takes. It's the effort it takes. And I've never seen it done another way. When I look at all of the spiritual giants, and I'm not talking pastors, I'm not talking preachers, I'm talking the faithful ones, who had a routine, who had a schedule, who had a chair, who had a devotional, who had areas in their life that they were putting underneath the, the microscope to watch their life, to watch their doctrine, to watch their heart closely. But Dallas says, it's great that you have a vision. And it's good that you have the, the desire to have this embodied will, this intention to make the choices to become. 
more like Christ. But he's like, you need one more thing. And he called it the means or the method. And the means or the method are the specific practices that you install to prepare you for life. So, so in many ways, I kind of grew up where the, the, the spiritual practices were serve the church, give to the church, and come on the weekends. Which I, I, I did really well. Like, I did really well at that. Maybe not so much the giving, like, in my 20s. But, like, I did, I, I served and I showed up. And it, and it worked an achievement muscle. And then all of a sudden, when suffering and pain and trauma hit, when temptation hit, I, I didn't have the practices. So again, all of a sudden, all these things, I was like, oh, that makes sense. But then Sabbath, or fasting, uh -oh, prayer. I go on a whole list of these ancient practices and these become the means and the methods to actually help you become your vision. To help you embody your vision. John Orberg tells a story with Dallas once that Dallas was speaking and, and some young gun from some local college came up to him and just wanted to pepper him. Just, and not pepper him, but like take him down a notch. And Dallas stood there listening and listening and said, thank you. And the, and the guy was looking for a fight. This young gun was looking for a fight. And Dallas didn't give it to him. And then John walked up to Dallas and said, hey, you could have decimated that guy. Why didn't you? And Dallas looked back and said, because my practice for this season is not having the last word. So, so, so again, the guy who has the smartest guy probably in the room, who has definitions for words that like become book titles, ruthless and elimination of hurry. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's like what this guy does. And he's like, but that's not, I got to watch my life closely. I got to watch my doctrine. I'm going to put a practice in where I'm choosing to not have the last word. What's your practice? Because again, we all, we all know you don't drift towards patience. We all know you don't just drift towards the kind of person who's humble. But how, how, how do you do this? And so there's, there's kind of the, the importance of shaping a vision. But then if you're, if you're thinking about it going, man, well, I think humility is the word for me right now. I, I think patience is the word. Well, then I, then I start <clears throat> looking through the scriptures and I want to learn everything I can about that word. A number of years ago, it was the word sincerity. I, I had read it in that, that cadet's prayer and I was like, sincerity. I like the way it sounds, but sincerity. Did you know sincerity in the original language is the letter A and then the word hypocrite? And in Greek, when you had that, when you had that A, it literally meant anti hypocritical. So hypocrite, sincere, hypocrite was all about wearing masks when you would perform in the amphitheater, which all of you know this. And, and, and you have these backpacks and these actors would get up and they would put on a mask and they would perform and then they would put a different mask to be a different character and put on a different one, a different persona. To literally be sincere meant to drop the mask. So then the question became, all right, in this whole sense of having a vision of a life anchored in Jesus is one that has nothing to hide. Well then, stop centering yourself. Stop trying to make yourself a hero. And then I found myself just coming back to Philippians chapter 2. Value others above yourself. Or these verses that literally like when Jesus emptied himself out of all of his power. I just, I just found myself meditating on that. And I found a verse and I just started meditating on that and go, man, how, how do I just keep putting this into practice? How do I keep choosing this? And hoping that somehow I will become more sincere. That when people see me, 
They won't see me trying to strive or achieve or get ahead or platform. They'll see me. And again, I just say all this, nobody drifts towards that. So, so what's that? What's that? Maybe let's just stay with the fruit of the Spirit. And you're all creative people. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you're like, ah, it's a different word. It's a different word from the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe it's like humility or sincerity or, or something else. Maybe, maybe it's even a spiritual gift like evangelism that you've just allowed just to go a little dormant. And you're like, this is a muscle that Christ wants to kind of, kind of reignite within me. And so if you have a vision, and that's clear, then you have this intention to say, every day when I have choices, I'm going to choose to actually make the decisions that are going to help me live out my vision. And then what's the practice? What's the method? What's the mean that's going to help put me in situations that I have to be patient? If you live in Southern California and you want to grow in patience, drive on the 405. It took me an hour and seven minutes to get here today. My Lyft driver from Long Beach drove, went across to the 22, came down Beach Boulevard, didn't want to get on the 405, drove all the way down, cut over on Warner, up on Magnolia, and passed by the church, had her flip around. And I'm sitting here going, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> it's not the way I would do it, but we'll get there when we get there. But if you want to learn that stuff, you've got to put yourself in situations. Now, because... I love college basketball. I played, uh, walked on at Cal State Fullerton. I like to say I played college basketball, but not really. I sat the bench, but I got free shoes. Um, but I, 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 love, I love the fact where you would have these moments where you watched game tape. Because it was so fun just to watch where my friends would be like, oh man, I, I dominated that game. And I was like, bro, you didn't. I had a front row seat. I was eating Skittles watching you. You didn't dominate. <laughs> And then we watched the film, and he didn't dominate. See, the film doesn't lie. That's one of the great gifts of film. But, but oftentimes, when you have a vision, you have the intention, you have the means or methods, sometimes we just live it, let it kind of live in this ethereal place. And if you go back to like Proverbs chapter 4, you have this beautiful, this word of a father speaking to his son. And he's basically saying, hey, if I can just stress one thing, chase, chase after Sophia, Sophia is the word for wisdom. Chase her. Run after her. There's nothing more stunning than her. And then he flips it and he says something so profound. He says, do you understand? Above all else, I want you to chase Sophia. You will make better decisions if you chase Sophia. But check this. Above all else, guard your heart. Because everything flows from it. Guard your heart. And, and again, I, I think of an incredible defender in the game of basketball, someone who does not want you to touch the ball. We guard our Facebook login. We guard our Chase Bank login. We guard our Social Security number. We guard a lot of things. But how much do we as pastors and church planners and leaders and shepherds guard this? And if everything flows out of this, that word is the word tosa. Everything that flows out of this, that originates, and underneath verses 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, it's saying what you see flows out of this, what you say flows out of this, where you go flows out of this. I think one of the most important things that we can do is guard this. Because everything flows from it. I didn't know my biological father and my, when I was born, I was given the name Stephen Charles Bourne. Charles was my biological father. His dad was the, the four-star general that's buried at West Point. I didn't know him. My mom remarried, and I, I got adopted. I got to change my middle name. I was four years old. <laughs> they, the judge said, what do you want your middle name to be? And I said, Poncharella, because uh, I watched <laughs> Chips as a kid. My mom was like, no, it'll be Ryan. Um, and... Uh, I, I, I remember like leaving with a new dad and her new last name and I never knew my dad and my biological father. And it wasn't until 2004, I had always had this inkling like, who is Chuck? When things were hard, I wondered like, oh man, Chuck. Deep down, I played the game of basketball because there was one quote in the book Fab Five by Mitch Albom. Remember, kids are perceptive. They're just crappy interpreters of reality. 
that said that Jalen Rose's father saw him playing while he worked out at a YMCA. And that's how Jalen met his dad. As a sixth grader, I read that. I was way better at soccer, but I read that going, oh, this is how Chuck will find me. So as a 5'11 kid with no jump shot, a walk-on at Cal State Fullerton, trying deep down to have Chuck find him. I never said that, but that's, that's what drove me. 2004, I hire a private investigator. I find out that Chuck lives in upstate New York in a city called Afton. So I'm going to just show up. My wife and I, we buy plane tickets. We feel like we'll go to Boston, see uh, Fenway, and then drive up to the color tour of upstate New York and just show up, knock on his door and be like, hey, Dad, it's me. I'm 20. How are you? Cool. Uh, can I get a hug? Um, I feel like an elf. But, like, uh, <laughs> but three days before my... Uh, my private investigator calls and goes, I'm so sorry, um, we missed this, but uh, your, your, uh, your dad died of a massive heart attack two years ago. I was like, oh my goodness. And I already have the tickets, so we decide to go, and we show up to the cemetery, and for 20 minutes, I walk around the cemetery. I have a little camcorder, and I'm just like walking and just reading tombstones. And I come to this tombstone that says Charles Franklin Bourne. And I meet my dad. And I have just like this moment there. And I find out he died of this massive heart attack. And it's a couple years later. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to a physical, which I never really go to. And uh, the doctor says, um, any new information about your, your medical History, family history. I'm like, oh, it's crazy. Found out my biological father died a couple years ago of a massive heart attack. And she's like, what? She's like, uh, and she like freaks out. This Ghanaian woman just like freaks out, starts like listening to my heart. And she's like, all right. She leaves the room and she's like, hey, come here, come here, come here. They start listening to my heart. I'm like, she's like, how old was your dad? I'm like, I think he was like in his early 50s, mid 50s, somewhere around there. She's like, really? They end up like calling the, at the hospital for me two days later to go to some EKG and get on a treadmill. I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, am I okay? And they're like, we'll see. And I'm like, what in the world? So I show up and all of a sudden they put you on this, this treadmill and I'm running for my life. It's like 6.1 miles, 7.2 miles. Obviously I don't run, 8.3 miles. They just start, and I'm like sweating. I'm like, forget this, man. I'm just going for it. Like I'm like running, 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 running. And they get done, and, and they're like, hey, um, you're going to have to watch some stuff with your heart. And I, and it was just this like weird epiphany, like as I'm, I'm driving home, talking to my wife, and I, I realized something, that this Ghanaian doctor, who doesn't know my dad and doesn't know me, cared more about my heart than I did. And I, and I, I think that sometimes happens in the spiritual side. You have a mentor, or you have an elder, or you have a, a spiritual director, or you have a dear friend, or you have a spouse, or you have an accountability partner who often cares more about your heart than we do. And what I, what I started to begin to do was going, well, if I'm going to have to guard this, because everything tosa flows from it, if I've got to, if I got to guard this, and the word heart in Hebrew is the word le, but it means like every drive per purpose, desire, decision, it all originates here. That's, that's where it's going to come and, and, and burst forth from. Well, how, how, how do I watch that game tape? And so you have the vision. I'm going to give you a moment to write that, to think about the intention, to, to think about some practices that you can put into play. But I want to give you one little gift. This has been one of the most helpful things for me is to almost look back. And, and it it's really kind of embodies Proverbs 4, but it helps you see, and am I, am I taking steps to embody, embody my vision, to become more like Christ, to let more of God's love and light and grace have space in me? So the first thing, if you're going to guard your heart, is <clears throat> you have to replay. And when I say replay, is you look back at the past 168 hours, and what I like to call it is play it back. You just play it back. You play the tape back. And you go, is there any moment where I just dropped the anchor and I chose the impulsive will? 
I just, sometimes we just don't ever play it back. And I just, I want to spend time and I don't want to live in the, the fruit of my decision. I want to actually get to why I made that decision. Was I hungry? Was I scared? Was I insecure? Did Sarah and I have like a little disagreement? Was I disappointed? Did I get triggered on Twitter because that happens? Or if you want to know where real crazy is, it's called the Next Door app. But like, like it is this somehow like something, I want to know what happened. Because that situation is going to happen again. And so I don't just replay it and play it out. Number two, I start to play it out. And I, I now kind of imagine myself in that same situation again. And I think to myself, I know one time I dropped the anchor. How and what do I need to do to actually make a better decision? And this time I imagine almost Jesus right beside me like as a, like as a great coach, like Coach K or, you know, just beside me and just saying, hey, how would you do it? If I was center in your life, how and what would you say or how would you hold on to this hope? And I just imagine it. I reimagine. So one, I replay. Number two, I reimagine. One, I play it back. Number two, I play it out. Number three, if the heart is where everything flows out of, what are you doing to refuel your heart? So, so I, I, I play it back, I play it out, I refuel by playing it smart. Play it back, play it out, play it smart. And this is where I look at my schedule and go, do I, is, is my schedule just, because for many of us, we don't have margin in our life. And we don't have anything that's literally just fueling our heart. But is there, is there places for that practice? Is there places for that hike? Is there places for that moment of solitude? And, and truth be told, you're all creative beings. And the thing about creative, creative beings is you gain energy really quickly, but you lose it even quicker. And if everything flows out of this, what are you doing with your time and your money to refuel your heart? Lastly, you play it back by replaying. You play it out by reimagining. You play it smart by refueling. Lastly, you play it honest by respecting the emotions of your heart. You have to be honest. There's a reason we call it emotion because there's movement to your heart. And if you stuff those emotions, so many guys, how you doing? Good. How's, how are things, how's things going? Great. Church is great. Ministry is awesome. But we don't know how to talk about our disappointment. We don't know how to talk about our sadness. We don't know how to talk about the both and. And until we can actually be comfortable sharing and speaking about what's really going on in our heart, we're going to find ourselves just pretending when it comes to our vision, our intention, and our means. This makes sense? And so every Sunday night or Monday morning, this is a practice I just do. I just play it back. I play it out. I play it smart. And I play it honest. And in that, it allows me to guard my heart. And again, it just keeps me on a growth pattern towards making more space. So here's what I want to do. We've got a couple minutes and then we'll break for lunch. But I want you just to think. And maybe maybe we, just, we just start with the fruit of the Spirit. How many of you in this season, if you think about the nine fruits of the Spirit, would say, the one I need most is love? Just show of hands. Okay? How many of you would say it's joy? I just need joy, yeah? How many of you would say it's peace? Yeah. How many of you would say it's patience? It's just straight up, straight up. Don't even, no rush. Just going to rush all up. Patience. How many of you would say it's kindness? Yeah. A gentleness? Goodness? Faithfulness? Yeah. Self-control? Like I said, that's me. Okay. So now, now just write down this phrase. A life anchored in Jesus. A life anchored in Jesus. And then depending on that fruit, it doesn't have to be in cement right now, but, but write a vision around that word. Because can you imagine for your ministry team, for your congregation, for your family, for you, what that would look like if you had more love or more joy, or more peace or more patience or more kindness? 
And then just think about what's a, what's a method, what's a means, what's a practice, what's a discipline that's going to help me embody this so that when temptation comes and when crisis comes and when the unexpected comes and when uncertainty comes and when things don't go my way, I can still not lose that secure, steadfast, firm, and strong anchor named Christ because he's taken up so much residence in me. I just want to give you just a couple moments. Just kind of write that. And then, and then, you know, try it on for a week. And then play it back. Play it out. Play it smart. Play it honest. Make little, little tweaks, incessant tinkering. And then go at it another week. And just keep making space for this. So just take a moment, right? And then I'll close in prayer and then hand it back to Doug.